Today's episode is going to be a fun one for me. I connected with our guest today, who is a neighbor and a friend, immediately. When he and his family moved into the neighborhood, I just, it was, it was again, it was immediate connection. He, he's not afraid to try new things. He's extremely handy and creative and exudes entrepreneurial spirit. Let me introduce him. Chris Wilson, welcome to the show, man. Uh, thanks for having me, Nick. Absolutely. You ready to have some fun, buddy? Let's do it. <laughs> you know, your your uh, path was started out as a traditional one. Uh, you you uh, went to West Chester University, graduate with a Bachelor of Science, and you got into teaching I guess a few years after that, correct? Correct. You were you were teaching for about twelve years at Pennsville High School. You were a health physical education teacher, right? Correct. You were coaching three different sports: wrestling, baseball, and soccer, which is extremely impressive. You know, to 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 fill those uh, those teacher days. <laughs> oh my God! Long days, long days. Yeah, I can only imagine. So about 12 years you did that. And your entrepreneurial spirit brought you back to your family business, which was farming. Correct. Correct. And you you were you were doing that what in the summer times, I believe you 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 indicated. Yeah, so my cousin, uh, my uncle has three kids, um, two girls and a boy. The boy is um, a year uh, older than me. So growing up, we'd always, always very close. And so even when I was a little kid, we would always, on the summer, I think I was recruited to uh, my aunt's house and pretty much lived out there. And we would work on the farm, drive the four-wheeler, you know, have a, have a blast. And uh, then we'd always go down to the beach for a, a week or two for vacation, come back and, and work on the farm. And then school would start back up. And then uh, when I went into teaching, uh, you know, obviously summers were off, uh, still did stuff with, with coaching and stuff, but uh you know, would, would help out on the farm and, and do some stuff there. No, good stuff. And, and, you know, to, you know, when, when we met and to find out that you were, you were an owner of the local, you know, farm, it, it became clear why, you know, you know, we connected. Do you know what today is? Today? No, I don't know what today is. You don't oh, know wait, what today is? Today's Earth Day, isn't it? Or today's something? Earth Day. How Earth fitting. Day. How fitting. I know. <laughs> I, it wasn't planned. It, it just happened to uh, happen on this day that we're, that we're having this talk and it's pretty awesome, man. <laughs> so you did, a, you pretty much did a full circle. Yeah. I mean, um, growing up, my parents both worked for DuPont's corporation, but my dad, he would work his eight hour shift. And then my grandpa and my dad owned a slaughterhouse and a pork store. So he would work there eight hours would come home, eat, and then go right to the pork store, or slaughterhouse, um, and run that six days a week. On Saturdays, he would go and, you know, get more cattle. So to keep that running, he did that for like 25 years. And then when I was in high school, he owned a convenience store. So I was, I was always working at the convenience store. And when I was younger, I was working at the pork store, slaughterhouse. So I always had an entrepreneurial spirit in me, I think from my dad and my mom. I mean, they both worked at DuPont's for 41, 42 years. Plus yeah. they were always, you know, entrepreneurial doing stuff on the side. Yeah. So it was in your DNA. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. No, I do too. So in, I guess, 1998 is, is, you know, you were, you were back basically back with the farm in the summers, you were helping to infuse technology uh, into the daily operations. And that was just during the summer times. Yeah, so, you know, a couple of things happened there. You know, my uncle was older um, and food safety was starting, to, it was starting to get discussed. And my uncle was always on the forefront of everything. We're probably second, third largest farm in uh, New Jersey, but he was always progressive. He was the first farmer to bring drip irrigation into the state. And, you know, he wanted to be ahead of the curve for food safety. 
So he asked if I, you know, come in and start that. And technology was just starting to get into farming as far as packing, um, packing lines and to make things more efficient. So he, he doesn't even know what a computer is. I uh, had always had a flip phone all his life. Uh, we'd had the Nextels. I remember doing all that crazy stuff. And you try to talk to him and he still have his hand on the button and you couldn't listen. So Nextels you know, we were all great. those technology things. But um, yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I came on the farm and started doing that, and then uh, it just it just worked out, you know, to, to come back and, and do this full time. And and the farm is Sorbella Farms CSA, correct? Well, the farm was Sorbella Farms, right? Okay, and then my uncle and his brother, his brother went to Rutgers uh, Engineering, and they had Sorbella Farms, and they mm-hmm. split up in two thousand. And his cousin, they were farmers and they came aboard. They were called, their last name was Wheeler. So it was Sorbello and Wheeler Farms. And then that went till about, I'd say six years ago. And the Wheelers retired, had an auction. And then I came on with my uncle. It was still called, it was just called Sorbello Farms. And then I farmed with my uncle for about three years. And then it was time for, for me to, to move on and for him to kind of, you know, slow down. So it, we turned it into Grotopia Farms. I brought a good friend of mine who was in the nuclear industry for 26 years and had no farming experience. Um, and then it was Grotopia Farms. And we, 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 we had Cerbella Farms CSA, which we would deliver stuff at, you know, to people's homes. And did that for a couple of years, had some challenges with that, mm-hmm. and just had to refocus. And you know, we might come back to that. I don't, I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens with that. So you're not doing the, uh, the fruit and vegetable like box no, we're not doing, we're not delivery. doing delivery. Okay. Um, I, I brought on our marketing lady who I've known for 20 plus years, um, embezzled money. And it kind of got to a point by the time I found out, oh. Steve and I, my partner, we had to shut it down, had to regroup, had to pay everybody that was not getting paid from oh, that. Wow. It was a learning experience. And it, it was a failure at that point, but you know, it was just a learning experience. So we're probably going to re-up up on and, and get that going. Um, and it was Got unfortunate because during COVID, it really what I think uh, really taken off. But yeah, really I mean, we, we were one of your customers, and I just I was looking to get back on that. I yeah, didn't, I didn't know that the, that you stopped it. I mean, it was it was very cool. And 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 Grotop- Grotopia Farms just started this year, right? I believe you. This is our fourth this, year in production for Grotopia Farms. Okay. For some reason, I've read when my research it was it was uh, February of this year. Uh, is that when you became the the the, the co owner, or did yeah, I read so that incorrectly? When we left for my uncle, um, that would have been four years ago. Okay, uh, it was Steve and myself. We formed Grotopia Farms, and we went from basically what I consider an old model, what my uncle did for years, grow three hundred and fifty acres of vegetables, mm-hmm. and that is, I'm telling you, a lot of vegetables and things in my opinion, needed to become small and efficient. The bigger you are, it's not always better. It's sometimes you just get too much labor, too much overhead cost, too much capital investment, just an operating standpoint. And there's a lot of risk out there because the, the farm industry, the produce industry has changed drastically in the last five years. So we went from 350 acres to 50 to 60 acres. And we're now a year round farm where we repack for our one customer um, all year round. So it, it gives us um, as much income as we made at a 350 acre farm, but with a lot less uh, risk out on the street. Got it. And is that Chipotle? Yes, Chipotle yeah. and Taco Bell. They both, yeah, both of those companies yeah. are. No, I knew you had a couple big ones. Um, and that's, is, is tomatoes, is that is that your biggest? That's it. We just do plum tomatoes. We used to do- So that's it right now. Got it. Got yeah. it. Okay. No, good stuff, man. Good stuff. So yeah, I wanted to talk about that vegetable vegetable box program because uh, you got to get that thing back on, man. That was yeah, uh, that was good stuff. <laughs> I tell you that the problem is um, sometimes as an entrepreneur, you have so many ideas and you put them into motion, yeah. but you need to have good management to really get things to yeah. stay consistent and do a good job and. It always seems like you can do it yourself and you can put a couple of people in place, but you know, you really to, you know, we kind of took a step back and said, look, if we're going to do this, we need to do it right. We need to have someone full time that's just managing that because, you know, we have so many different hats going on. 
it, it's, it's just difficult to manage everything. And sure you know, is. It's, it's tough. Yep. No, I, I, I can feel you there, man. Oh, I love it. And, and just back to the Rutgers University. So you worked with them to help implement the food safety program from its inception in New Jersey. Yeah. So we'll talk um, a little bit about that. Rutgers is their leaders. Um, one of the leaders, Cornell, um, probably Cornell and Rutgers are the two biggest in food safety in the university industry as far as agriculture. And uh, gentleman Wes Klein, he runs the program and my uncle knew him real well. So myself and a farmer right next to me, um, we actually started the program with them. And um, it was like the wild, wild west. You know, they kind of knew what some of the rules might be and farmers did not want to hear anything about it. So what we did is we voluntarily started to do audits and um, we knew that it, this is what was going to be the standard. And what's pretty different about the produce industry is everything is voluntary with your buyers. It's not, it just became regulated when Obama came in, he came a food moderniza modern is it modernization act. Modernization, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, really the audits that we do for our clients are like an, a university audit and the FISMA audit is kind of like a kindergarten audit. But the government had to come in and say, oh, we're doing something basically. So mm -hmm. we started with Rutgers in that program and we've been doing that for a long time. And, you know, it's just standard in industry. If you want to sell to big companies, Walmart, Chipotle and everything, you've got to have, uh, you know, audits. Got it. Got it. And Grotopia Farms is the first farm in New Jersey to actively use a spray scouting drone, yes. which uses much less pesticides than conventional equipment and provides real-time growing data from its high-tech camera system. You just recently were taking FAA uh, drone classes, right? You, you got to get your license? What is yeah, it, so 107 license? To take. Do that. I'll tell you, University of Delaware has a really awesome drone program, mm -hmm. and um, they uh, help you have a class you take so to help you prepare for the FAA test. So I'll be taking that test in two weeks. I have my last class coming up this Saturday. Awesome. But um, yeah, we've got a, it's a $40,000 drone. It's, it's a, it's a no joke drone. It's, is it that much? Yeah. It's like uh, wow. your DJI ones. DJI is a, a Chinese company. They're, they're the ones you see in Best Buy and they're a great company. You know, uh -huh. they're the, the Phantoms and the Mavics. They're little guys like this. This is a 55 um, pound and under drone, unmanned drone. Okay. But, um, wingspan's probably about eight foot. It's, it's wow. a pretty, pretty big guy. And uh, we have a, a thermal camera on it and it's got uh, a four gallon payload on it with spray bars. So okay. I send it up with a thermal camera. And what it does is it, it's kind of like, like humans, you know, when you feel good, you put off energy. When you're sick, you put off less energy. Same thing with plants. When that thermal camera is flying, it takes the pictures, puts it in this program, and you can see if they're yellow or red, there's Got something it. not right with the plant that if I visually looked at the plant, I couldn't tell. Yes. But it picks up the thermal reading and I and it, I can Before see it dies. Kind of what's going on, go out yeah. and field, maybe scout and, and maybe there's something, some issues going on. I was just going to say that's the scouting piece. I mean, for $40,000, yes. it's, it's got to be giving you some valuable data. That, that's good stuff. So that FAA license, what is it? It's called a 107 license? Is that what yeah, it is? FAA 107 is for un, unmanned, uh, unmanned aircraft, just like a, a pilot's license, except it's for unmanned and it's for 55 pounds and under. In the United States, you're not allowed to have a drone over 55 pounds. It's a whole different ball game when you get there. Uh -huh. Got it. And something I want to share that probably a lot of people don't know about you, um, doing, doing a little research on you. You were a propreneur, which you were actually a, a network marketing professional for 12 to 15 years. Talk a little yeah. bit about what, what you learned from that and, and, and how that's helped you with where you are today. Um, well, you know, it, it, believe it or not, I was super shy. I was a teacher, but I was mm -hmm. super shy. Um, yeah. You know, in my element of teaching phys ed, I was totally fine talking with students and peers and things like that. But to be able to stand in front of a room mm -hmm. and, and to talk, that just wasn't my deal. But, you know, when I got into network marketing, I was put into many uncomfortable uh, positions if you want to succeed, situations, yeah. and just the whole culture of always bettering yourself, 
reading books, you know, success leaves clues type mentality. Love it. Um, I started to get into that because I'll be honest with you, as far as a student, I went to private school, but I wasn't strong. I, B's, you know, was, was, was kind of where I hovered, the occasional C, and I hated to read. I did not like reading at all. But once I got into network marketing, that was kind of, if you wanted to be successful, it's kind of where you wanted to go. I was entrepreneurial. So, yeah. you know, I got into a lot of reading and then a lot of presenting and, uh, you know, knowing the different um, traits with people, the different personalities, how you have to talk to different people to get, you know, the kind of desired results you want and stuff like that is kind of, I think, I think that's the number one thing that's helped me out in my career was network marketing to, to, to push me to that. Yeah. No, and I, and we've, you know, we've talked obviously a lot you know, over the years and, and we've even traded some books. You, you are af- absolutely an avid reader. You, you're always talking about how you're reading and, and uh, you want to continue to do so. Uh, no, good stuff, man. I got into more audio. I, I find that I'm taking audio, you know, the audio books and taking that a little easier than, than, than finding the time to sit down. And I'm just, I just want to keep kind of moving, you know what I mean? Sitting versus sitting down and reading. I, I certainly do still read, but not as much as I used to. I'm, I'm picking up the audio thing and I'm, I'm liking it. Well, I'll tell you, I, I don't want to, I, I, since you brought that up, I, I do want to reverse one second. So before <laughs> network marketing, this is where I, I really got into also reading and everything. When I was in high school, we had a, when I coached and also when I coached baseball, I coached with a gentleman called Ed Rigger, a South Jersey Hall of Fame baseball coaches. He, he's, probably the top baseball coach I've ever been around. Mm -hmm. But I remember in high school, I didn't play baseball, but they would, for the first hour of practice, would be inside. They were listening to audio tape and things about conditioning, visualization and everything. And everybody thought he was crazy, but he had just championship teams left Mm -hmm. and right, state championships. And then when I went into network marketing, ironically, I found out that he was an extremely successful network marketer back in the day. And I used to listen to audio books, but when I actually, in my teaching career, when I started to connect with him, I got out of audio books because he was like, audio books were good. I know it's different for everyone, but he said, I want to teach people how to master and his, how he mastered. And I still follow it today. I read the book. I highlight everything that Got I think it. is important in the book. I go back and I, I type out all the highlight notes from that book. So I have a quick set copy of that. And then we always will do a discussion and talk about it. And I, I always thought in the beginning, I thought, well, that's kind of corny. Why are we talking? But when we got three or four people together and we talked about chapter one, it was amazing. I might have been 30 years old and I was looking at something, but someone yes. 55 years old looked yes. at something totally different, different. that different. I couldn't relate to because I just wasn't there yet. And yeah. when we started to do roundtable stuff and recorded it, then that kind of tied everything together. So yes. we, we read the book, we had notes and we had audio to go off of, but we just kept doing that like every month. <laughs> I love it. I mean, a level, level of comprehension varies so greatly, you know, from, from each individual and, and how you actually receive it, reading, you know, listening, everybody's different, like you said. And yes. uh, yeah, but, but to continue to read it again and highlight it and listen to it and then back and forth with, with a group setting, uh, that's, that, that's a good way to learn for sure, to take it all in. No, I love it, man. So since you, and, I, and this is really what I wanted to get into, because you, you know, you, you have the entrepreneurial spirit. You, you, you've been through the college setting. Um, you're running your own business now. Going back to college, we're, let's talk a little bit about that, because we've, we've had conversations, uh, deep conversations uh, about college and just the return on investment. And, um, you know, what, what, what does college not teach you in your words? Um, you know, my wife and I, we differ on this subject all the time. Mm-hmm. I think when I look back, when I went to college in 1990, 1994, I think it was a different setting then where, you know, there wasn't as many kids in college, you know, there was, it was just a different setting and the, the price cost was different. Return on investment was way different. I think it was yeah. probably $10,000 to go to Westchester then yeah. uh, somewhere in there a year. And then now today, 
I think we went, you know, you have to look at it as a business decision. There's so many people going to college and now trying to make it so kids go to college for uh, free. I couldn't now, agree what, more. What always, we talk about this all the time, and I hate to get on a soapbox, but what <laughs> frustrated me is I wanted to be a teacher. And when I looked at everything in my four years, why am I going back? If I'm going to be a physical health and physical education teacher, why am I taking a class on history? Why am I taking a class on, say, mathematics? Or I'm, I'm, I mean, I did it for 12 years already. I don't know yeah. what more math I would need to be a teacher. Right. And when I, when I looked at to be successful in teaching, it was when I did my student teaching in the elementary and in, in the secondary, in the last part of, of um, my degree. And then you really learn is when you went out there and you actually got a job. Right. You learned that's where you learned everything about yes. teaching. So what I don't understand is, is number one, your high school. I don't think they do a good job of finding out what your passion is. Number one. And number two, why are we letting 18 year old kids try to figure out what they want to do right then and there and then yes. investing all this money? And that yes. might not. I'm not even in, te in, in teaching anymore. Right. But. I, I don't know. I think it could be done so much easier, so mm. much more efficient, and, and instead of just the way it's mm. set up right now. I th and I also think once the government loan or the student loans were backed by the government, then that's when you saw the prices start to go astronomical. Yes. For the because yep. if they if they default, we're, we're, you know who's on the hook for it? Predatory lending, man. Yes, that's uh, exactly what it is. I don't know. And uh, man, I mean, that's why I, I was so looking forward to this because everything you just said, I couldn't agree with more, you know, more. Uh, I, I mean, passion, like, and, and kids and kids at 18 years old, how many know what they want to do? Like how many are ready to, to even leave, you know, the, 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 the homestead, like, are, are they really ready to go away? And that's why over a million kids fail out of college annually. Because they're they're go they're getting pushed to go, or they think that's the only way to go, and it's just wasted, wasted money, you know. Well, and if you look and, at how your high schools are set up, Nick. You know, when I was in school, they had Votech, and they had they had I had to go to, to they had a shop class and mechanical drawing and, and things like that. You know, you're working on lawnmowers, whether you like it or not. You had to take some of those basic class, home ec, things like that. Yep. So now a lot of places don't have that anymore. So now your high school is basically whatever your experience in high school is kind of what you're what you're kind of being molded into what's out there. And I don't think a lot of people actually know all the different jobs that are out there and, no. and the amount of money you can make at these jobs and how little of competition Absolutely there is not. as far as people getting into these fields. Yep. Yep. I mean, you touched on it. Trade basics curriculum. You got to have trade basics curriculum in schools and, and, and they don't. No. They don't. Um, <laughs> I mean, some, what some of these kids and, and when I say kids, I mean, early 20s, what they're making because they were in the trades immediately after high school. And some of them in, you know, in in in, in a tech school, tech high school, and they were working, making 20, 30 dollars an hour, like immediately after because they already had that hands on experience. And they love what they were doing. They're passionate and, and they're go-getter. And there's so many opportunities out there, like, like you said, that people just don't even realize. Yeah, I mean, isn't it about income to debt ratio, right? I mean, if I'm going to invest $65,000 a year over the next four years, but when I come out of that, I'm only making fifty to 55000 whereas I go to a trade school or a different yeah. profession where I can maybe invest a fraction of that, yes. I mean, less than that. Yes. But like you said, start making twenty, thirty, forty dollars yes. an hour. Your your income to debt ratio. Not it doesn't take too long for you to be no. on the right side rather than no. the wrong side of it. It's like starting a business. I, I can't uh. invest, um, you know, a quarter of a million dollars to make a fifty thousand dollar revenue a year. It just, it just it's not going to work out. Yep. Man, you're talking my language. I mean, do you think that a lot of people go to college or, 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 you know, feel their children should go to college because they think that degree, that piece of paper is, is the end all? Well, I'll say this. 
I think education opens doors for you. Mm -hmm. I think you have to determine what your definition of an education is. Mm -hmm. I think too many people assume that education means a college education. I don't, I mean, I get educated every day. I every day. Educating myself. You never yes. stop doing that. Yes. But if, if you're going to, you got to educate yourself. You got to figure mm. out what field you want to go into before you start to commit to an education. I feel yes. if I want to become uh, a carpenter, I don't need a $60,000 degree from a college or $50,000 mm -hmm. degree from no. a college. So if no. you don't first determine where you want to go or what you want to do, or even put yourself in position, let's say for the first three years, oh, good. instead of paying all this money, why don't you go intern with people? And what, what if I went to you and said, Nick, can I pay you $10,000 a year to work for you? And get an education like that. Yeah. You'd be yes. way more ahead if you did that with five different professions and figure yes. out where you And you, you find out what your passion is. Yes. And yeah. you're not going to be 65000 in the hole for each year. You're Listen, I, I, you know, we want the college. The college experience is a great one. But I had a plan. I knew what I wanted to do. And I'm still doing that. You know, if you don't know what you want to do and you're not passionate about it, I, I think it's an absolute waste. Yes, if you want to be a doctor. Yes, if you want to be a lawyer, a dentist, an accountant. Those things that require that piece of paper, yes, yes. But just to go and get a degree with no clear direction on which way you want to go, you can figure out that without spending all that money. And then, like you said, even work, work or figure things out. You can always go back to college later when you know, too. And, right. and, and kids are, I mean... Kids, I don't think are all, most are not ready to go away and experience college the way it should be experienced, which means to get that education, to get that degree. And, and that's why I think a lot of, you know, a lot of people fail out. They party yeah. out, fail out. They just don't have a, a, you know, a focus or a passion for it. And it's also a, a financial burden, I think, which is why a lot of people don't continue as well. You know, I, I teach my kids that you are an entrepreneur. Whether you work mm -hmm. for somebody or you own your business, you are an entrepreneur. Yeah. You need to have the entrepreneurial mindset that you're always improving. You're always trying always. to better yourself. And then, you know, I'm not a farmer. I'm an entrepreneur. I use agriculture as my vehicle to generate income. Yeah. I think that's, I think when you approach everything like that, not I'm an employee. No, you're an entrepreneur yes. and you're, you're using this industry to generate your income. So, so good, Chris. This is why I was excited to uh, have you on and to talk <laughs> shop, entrepreneurial shop. So the stigma about the trades and trade and vocational schools, why, why do you think it still exists? Because there's no, I don't think there's any exposure. I don't mm -hmm. think there's any exposure. And I think, I mean, look, those, those industries, you're going to work. But, you know, you're going to work at anything you do. You know, sitting behind a desk, that's just not for me. And working all day behind a desk, yeah. that's not for me. Yeah. You know, I guess you can make a lot of money doing that, but it's not for me, period. But I just don't think there's any exposure. I just had an electrician come out. My, I had two wells in the same week go down. I needed new electronics. They came out, and in about five hours, they diagnosed everything. They put in these new panels on the wall and all this stuff. The bill was about $5,000 the, uh, the, and the labor part of it was over half of what the components were. And, you know, the guy drives around in his car. He knows electricity, three phase electricity, mm -hmm. all this stuff, you know, there, and now and my well guy, right? The well guy is very specific. He drills, he drills well. It's not a glamorous job, but let me tell you, they make a lot of money. They're yeah. putting in five, $6,000 just pumps in there i mean mm -hmm. he's got his own got his first of all his truck is about a million dollars that does, that puts these wells in yeah and i just don't <laughs> think there's any exposure to all these different and they need people right now that's the craziest thing they can't find people the guy that um works on all our equipment as far as uh, cars you know all our vehicles and everything he can't find mechanics can't yeah. find mechanics because hardly any kids are going into that anymore because it's i just don't think it's pushed by uh by schools it's 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 certainly not and that and that goes back to the predatory lending i think and the government really pushing you know for college um that's a whole nother whole nother discussion 
But manufacturing infrastructure and transportation fields are expecting to grow like ridiculous over the next 10 years. And that just opens up so many, so many opportunities and jobs, uh, you know, like, like you were just talking about. And let me ask you a question too. Do you know that there's over 500,000 construction jobs available right now in the United I States? It. I believe it. And, and, and a lot of that is, a lot they, of that is residential any jobs. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of it's I residential. Have, um, the pool guys always come to me because they're digging pools. They need somewhere to put dirt. So I always get free dirt. Well, the guy came the other day and said, look, you know, I, I got to stop coming for a while. And I said, well, well, why is that? Business slow. He said, no, we had to tell the sales guy to stop selling pools because we can't put them in fast enough and we mm -hmm. can't find enough people to work to yeah. put the pools in. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a crazy industry right now because of people being home, you know, they don't want to go anywhere. And it's just crazy how a pandemic, what it can do, you know, change so many things. Speaking of which, how did that impact your, your production? Um, yeah, production. So when we don't grow during our season, Chipotle and Taco Bell, they still need tomatoes. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm a family farm of a company called Littman. They're the largest tomato growers in the country. So when I stop growing, I provide a lot in the Northeast for those companies. Then what happens is they send tomatoes. Right now, I'm getting tomatoes, two truck to, tractor trailer loads a day from Florida. They come to my facility. I clean them up. So they go to my same customer 10 miles away, and they make salsa six days a week out of it. So we would do 12 tractor trailer loads a week. Once COVID hit, we did five tractor trailer loads for seven weeks, just five total in a seven wow. week period. So it went next to nothing. Mm. And as of today, which is about it, just over a year, we're up to about seven to eight a, a week, you know? So we're probably at mm -hmm. seven, running at 75%. I expect with the vaccines in the next month or so, we should be around, you know, um, hundred percent, I would hope. Gotcha. So outside of your, your business, which you're, you're obviously very passionate about, um, what do you, what do you like to do outside of your work, you know, by way of hobbies? Uh, you passionate about? Family. I think that's one yeah. of the biggest things uh, from what my uncle did. He lived to farm. And I can respect that with a lot of old timers. That's all they know. That's all they love to do. And then they maybe go hunt in the off season and uh, family with myself and my partner, Steve is like number one. So we wanted mm -hmm. to change our business structure around to where we could spend more time with the family, less time on the farm, kind of leverage our time. So when I'm not here, I like spending time with the family. I love, we love going hiking, um, love water sports, love jet skiing, love boating, being at the beach, um, things like that. A lot of outdoorsy stuff. Yep. I like to read on my hobby time yep. um, and spend time with my wife as much as I can. Uh, being divorced, you know, kids are with me for seven mm -hmm. days and with my ex and same thing with, with my wife, uh, Joey. So we never thought that we would like the time away, but we have two weekends a month where it's just us time, you know, so we, we always like to go out and do stuff and spend time together. Good stuff. Love it, man. So I'm going to end on... If someone wants to get into farming, they want to get into construction, they want to get into the entrepreneurial world, which is the not traditional path. What, what, what would you, as someone that has experienced pr pretty much a full circle of things, um, you know, what would your advice be for someone that wants to find their passion? You know, how would they do so? I think you got to go find the most successful people in the industries that you feel you may be interested in. And like, let's say agriculture, you might think it's just farming, but when you, if you would come to me about agriculture, there's a lot of different things in agriculture you might be interested in. Like if you're a technology guy, drones right now, I think is going to mm. be the future. Robotics is going to be too. the future. Um, food safety is enormous. And, and there's so hmm. many offshoots to the agriculture industry that you may not know about. Same thing with construction. Maybe you're not physically in construction, but you're in subsets that, you know, lend to construction. There's other industries, other vendors you deal with, other things. And I think you need to find the most successful person 
go there, start there, and start mm. picking their brains, start yes. asking questions. Can I hang out? I mean, a lot of what yes. I've learned has just been hanging out with people, talking with people, keeping my ears open, and and with the internet now, and kids have a, just a, a tremendous ability to start their own businesses and start alternate things. I mean, when when I looked at, I've been looking at drones for four years, and there's like tens of thousands of them over in Asia. And here in the United States, there's hardly any. Mm -hmm. And it's coming. I mean, it, it's coming. There's people that go out with their hard hats with 20 drones to a farm, and they all are running at the same time off one iPad. And they have five or six people. And I, I can see that's where it's going to go. Mm -hmm. Like, if I'm looking as a farmer, I can buy a $350,000 sprayer 90 foot long and go do that have to take care of a hydraulic system um, a diesel engine everything that goes along with that air condition system all the maintenance and everything or i can get a drone that's really has little electric motors on it and batteries and it's smaller it's fast which is a whole different mentality of doing things you know it's but yeah. sometimes we think bigger is better you know that green john deere is so cool but mm -hmm. i think you got to use your head I think you have to use the internet, see what's out there yes. and go find successful people and, and just pick their brains. Yeah. And then something I'll add, and that was such a great share. Uh, something I'll add with, with, with finding someone that inspires you or successful is, is go to them and say, listen, I will work for you for free. Just, just be around that person, work for them to, to just, like you said, pick their brain, but just being around them and something that I think would grab someone is, listen, I will help you work for you for free. And just that time around someone that is successful, that inspires you or is doing something that, that, that you, you know, you like, you're going to learn, you're, you're going to learn a tremendous amount. And it's just that time there, like you said, picking their brain and, and, and being around them and, and learning good stuff, man. Hey, one, one other question. What, what, uh, what DIY projects you have going on these days? What, what are you welding? What are you, what are you, what are you doing in the house? Oh, um, <laughs> still doing some stuff on the inside. I, I, I like doing stuff, but I hate doing all the little things, the finishing stuff. So I'm hiring someone to do that. Uh, uh, next thing I want to do is yes, <laughs> outside of my house, new windows. I want white. I want the metal roof. I kind of want that farmhouse modern look and mm -hmm. kind of go in there. But you know, it all costs money. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it does. This was awesome, man. I hope you had as much fun as me. Uh, I was looking forward to this and I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks for reaching out. Absolutely, man. And we're going to catch up soon because you're only a block away. <laughs> right across the street. <laughs> Thanks again. And I'll talk to you. Real right, soon. See you. Appreciate see it, you, man. Yeah, bye.